Hello, and welcome to A Shadow of Divine Perfection, Art of the Italian Renaissance and Baroque. My name is Dr. Katie Clark, and on behalf of the patrons of the arts and the Vatican Museums, a very warm welcome to all of the patrons joining us today, as well as to all our friends and guests. Thank you so much for being with us. Today's lecture, Mona Lisa's Smile, is the fifth of this seven-part series. If you'd like to re-watch any part of today's talk or see any previous lectures from this or other series, you can always visit californiapatrons.org slash lecture dash series, as well as our YouTube channel or our Facebook page. This lecture series is underwritten and presented by the California and Northwest chapters of the patrons. As a nonprofit organization, the patrons of the arts work to preserve, protect, and restore the vast and unique treasures housed in the Vatican Museums in Rome. The museums undertake constant and extensive restoration efforts, working hard to protect and preserve everything from Etruscan bronzes to Egyptian statues to Renaissance masterworks. The effort of restoration is labor intensive and painstaking, and it's based in rigorous and meticulous scientific research carried out in the museums. Patrons have unique access to tour these restoration labs when in Rome, as well as behind the scenes tours of the Sistine Chapel and the museums. Our fundraising efforts directly support the ongoing efforts to restore works inside the museums. Patrons undertake sponsorship of specific projects, both individually and as chapters. You can learn more about becoming a patron and assisting with restoration work by visiting our website at californiapatrons.org. Since we're pleased to welcome over a thousand people to today's talk, your sound and video will be turned off. However, during the lecture, you can enter any questions you have for Rocky or any technical assistance into the Q&A box that you see at the top or the bottom of your screen. We'll answer as many questions as we can live during the Q&A period at the conclusion of the talk. And if you'll enter your name along with your question, we can make sure to get you an emailed response for any questions we don't have a chance to get to live. And now it's my pleasure to introduce you to our presenter today, Dr. Rocky Ruggiero. Rocky Ruggiero is a professor of art and architectural history, a lecturer for various American universities. He has also appeared in a number of TV documentaries about the Italian Renaissance. After living in Florence for nearly 20 years, Rocky now divides his time between the U.S. and Italy, offering specialized lectures on art and architectural history. In Italy, Rocky leads private excursions and adult programs in Florence, Rome, Venice, Siena, and Northern Italy. Whenever the patrons visit Italy on our chapter trips, Rocky is one of our favorite experts to guide us through the many museums and cultural highlights that we see. So please welcome Dr. Rocky Ruggiero. Grazie, Katie, as always, for that fantastic introduction. Uh, thank you to all of you for joining me today. And so a big buongiorno or buonasera, wherever you might be uh, in the world. Uh, and today we're talking about representations of emotion in Renaissance and Baroque art. And I think as most of you probably know, the sort of holy grail of uh, uh, emotion in art is, of course, the most famous painting on planet Earth, uh, which is Leonardo da Vinci's portrait of Mona Lisa Gherardini. And in fact, I use this as a sort of iconic representation of this notion of how artists, uh, in fact, represent emotion. Right? Uh, and consider that there's been so much that's been written about the Mona Lisa um, concerning its history and its meaning. Uh, and one of the most famous aspects of the statue, of course, is this rather enigmatic smile on her face. What does this smile communicate? What does it represent? And curiously, Giorgio Vasari, who now you've heard me mention so many times, and now that all of you are familiar with Vasari, I am going to say to the point of annoying you for the remaining three of these lectures, Vasari says, Vasari says, right? So the first thing we do when we begin a research campaign is to pick up Vasari, author of a book called The Lives of the Artists, first published in the year 1550. So this is a primary source. It is to a Renaissance art historian, a Bible. And you notice how quick I was to just pick that thing up. It never leaves my side. And curiously, Vasari explains the smile on Mona Lisa 
in a very simple way. He says that Leonardo da Vinci was known to actually have musicians and jesters in his studio. So that while a sitter was there and Leonardo was painting his or her portrait, the musician would play, the jester would perform, and technically this would ward off the melancholy, as Vasari calls it, that was inherent in painting someone's portrait. In other words, by painting someone, essentially there was this sort of intrinsic melancholy that uh, appeared, and so Leonardo had figured out a way to get rid of it, and so presumably Mona Lisa is smiling because behind Leonardo, there's some guy juggling and there's some guy playing a banjo or something like that instead. But leading up to and then beyond Leonardo da Vinci, right? how do artists actually represent a wide array, obviously, of human emotions? And let's back all the way up to antiquity, right? To the classical world where emotion was usually sublimated in statues. And the reason is because the almost exclusive subject matter of classical art was divinities, right? in other words, gods. And so the idea that because they are perfect spiritual beings, they are above the human condition. And so I jokingly call statues like this one the 2% body fat Evian water drinking people, right? Characterized by classical uh, Greek sculptors. And so the idea that they don't get tired, they're not lazy, they're not distracted, they're gods, effortless. And you may remember from last week when we looked at those two fabulous statues by Bernini of the Apollo and Daphne and the Pluto and Persephone, where the gods, Apollo and Pluto, were effortless in what they were doing, whereas the nymphs, Daphne and Persephone, looked absolutely desperate instead. And so that contrast between lack of emotion uh, and expression nonetheless. Well, classical style sculpture eventually gives way to Hellenistic style sculpture, where suddenly the ethos of the classical world was replaced with the pathos of the Hellenistic. Now, when something is pathetic. It has this kind of negative connotation today. But in reality, or literally, what it means is that when something evokes emotion. So the pathos that was typical in Hellenistic art, such as the uh, celebrated Laocoon, where the high priest of Troy is struggling desperately uh, to free himself and his sons of these sea monsters who were sent to assassinate him. And look at the expression on his face. It couldn't be any different from the sculpture that I just showed you. So we go from no emotion to almost too much emotion in this particular work. But then with the breakdown, in fact, I gave a lecture last night on Ravenna and the Byzantine mosaics in Ravenna. And really, it's one of my favorite periods in, in history, this late imperial Roman, early Christian period, as we call it, because the, the values of that Greco-Roman world no longer held any weight, right? That world came to an end in the fifth century. And so the art that the Greeks and the Romans produced also sort of lost its value. And so not surprisingly, this emotional expression typical of Hellenistic art uh, was then replaced by this more abstract style of pictorial representation, which in this case I take from the church of Santa Polina de Nuovo in Ravenna, uh, uh, from the 6th century, where way up top, it's interesting, this is the earliest known cyclical representation of the life of Jesus Christ. You know, and again, I made a point of this last night when I was talking about it. It seems so odd because we're so used to seeing the life of Christ as the main subject of so many different works. Instead, in this church, it's relegated to this very awkward position at the top of the wall where you really actually have to look for it in order to see it. And the example that I show you is one of my favorites, and that is the Marys at the tomb. Right? So this is the episode on Easter morning where the Marys show up to the tomb of Christ only to find it empty. Right? Now, we could ex examine this on so many different levels. The first thing that captures my attention is that the tomb of Jesus is actually a classical Greco-Roman mausoleum instead of a kind of you know, more uh, typical wall tomb that would, they would have used at the time. But I also love the expression of the Marys. It reminds me of sort of vaudeville, where they look at the angel and sort of throw their hands up. You can almost see the subtitle appear at the bottom here, like a silent movie, you know, where is he? Because what's happening is that art is changing. Art is reflecting the values of the society that produces it. And those values, of course, that were held by the ancient Greeks and Romans no longer hold weight.
because the Roman Empire had come to an end. So we go through this period of abstraction, technically, in art. Now, we start to see emotion reappear in art right around the time that this structure that you see behind me, which is my favorite work of art in the entire world, the Scrovegni Chapel, was executed by Giotto in the early 1300s. And what I thought I would do is essentially to sort of showcase different human emotions and how famous works of art actually express them. And so let us begin on a rather negative note with the emotion of despair. And again, you'll see that I'm very partial to Giotto, who I believe is perhaps the greatest artist in terms of representing emotion. And in fact, we're going to begin inside of the Scrovegni Chapel in the city of Padua, where essentially we have three horizontal tiers making up the chapel, each one representing a different story, the life of the Virgin Mary up top, the uh, infancy and mission of Jesus Christ in the middle, and then the passion of Jesus Christ on the lower level. And we're going to begin down here by the altar with the first scene, which is the expulsion of Joachim. And if you don't know, the medieval legend concerning the life of the Virgin Mary was that her parents were very old and were without child, which their society thought uh, reflected the fact that they must have committed some sort of sin for which they were being punished, notwithstanding that Joachim would go to temple week after week to offer sacrifice in hopes that it was accepted and that God would heed his prayers and reward him and his wife and with a child. Well, obviously, uh, the uh, message here in the scene of the expulsion of Joachim is that the priest says, basta. Obviously, God is not listening to you. And so he expels Joachim, eventual father of the Virgin Mary, who's right here from the temple. And Joachim, who we know is older, uh, because of a very simple motif, and that is the white hair that Giotto has given him, uh, with the halo, so we know he's also holy, embracing the very lamb that he brought to sacrifice now, like a teddy bear. You see that? This is simple despair on his part. And true Giotto, this is sort of the essence of Giotto, to juxtapose, you know, this tragic scene of poor Joachim being kicked out of the temple outside with this younger man, and we know he's younger because he has a full head of brown hair, receiving a blessing from a priest because he's probably just informed the priest that his wife is expecting a child. So while we have desperation on the outside, we actually have joy instead on the inside. And here's Giotto. And that's what makes him such <clears throat> a giant, almost an anomaly at the beginning of the 14th century. Because not only is he reintroducing emotion, he's actually reintroducing it more successfully than what most of the later masters that I'm going to discuss ever will. So the next scene, I'm not going to show you the whole sequence, but just specific episodes that communicate the emotions, is Joachim going out into the wilderness. Now, when I usually ask people to describe to me the emotional state in which Joachim finds himself, I get depressed, sad. Uh, my favorite description is down in the dumps. Right? And I always imagine if there were empty aluminum cans scattered on the ground, that Joachim would be kicking those cans as he walked along. But it's not enough to say that he's sad. You have to tell me how we know or why we know that he is sad. And there's some very simple but incredibly effective uh, motifs that Giotto was using. The first of which is the gesture of his arms. Right? We kind of forget this, but this is perhaps the most instinctive of our gestures, and that is to kind of hug or embrace ourselves when in reality what we're doing is covering up the most vulnerable part of our bodies. When Homo erectus stood up, we were doing something very dangerous. We were exposing our vital organs. And so even today when something kind of traumatic happens, our normal instinct is sort of to hug ourselves. And that's exactly what Joachim is doing, reflective of the fact that he is despairing. Or how about the fact that Fido could not be any happier to see his master as he comes out yelping away, wagging his tail. But if you notice, Joachim is oblivious to its celebrations. He's looking right past and down, right? And how do we know that Joachim is not always in this particular state? That is my favorite detail of the painting. Look at the two shepherds who are presumably in, under the employment of Joachim. They come out to greet their boss and look at this nonverbal communication where this guy shoots the look at the other guy. And without saying a word, we can all hear what's up with him. And so we know that Joachim is usually not in this sort of depressed state 
in which we actually see him now, right? Or other images of despair, right? Also in the Scrovania Chapel, uh, his famous lamentation, uh, where essentially you kind of have two subjects in one because remember lamentation is when a group of people are lamenting the death of Jesus Christ, which is what you see. But Giotto's genius actually has two figures kind of framing Mary holding the torso of her son. So it becomes a pieta and a lamentation at the same time. And more than the mourning gestures of the human figures that you see, what I adore most is the um, gestures of the angels. This reminds me of a chorus in a Greek tragedy you know, that constantly remind us of what the tone is of a particular scene or a particular moment of the story. And not only is earth mourning the death of Jesus Christ, but so too is heaven. And look, you know, you just sit there, I mean, but look at the gestures. You know, this figure with his hand sort of next to his head, this figure pulling its hair, uh, this figure in total despair. I mean, it is literally like a, like a textbook of gestures to represent despair, the arms that are thrown out, this figure bringing its hands to its cheeks as are these as well. And so Giotto, not limiting that despair just to the figures down below, uh, but to again, these angelic figures up above. And Giotto's natural air in terms of painting and uh, successfully rendering naturalism is the artist who painted the frescoes in the Brancacci Chapel, or part of the frescoes, I should say, in the Brancacci Chapel, whose name was Masaccio. And now, if you're not familiar with Masaccio, in fact, just published um, this part two of a two-part podcast on Masaccio's painting of the Holy Trinity last Wednesday. Uh, he is one of the most extraordinary artists in history. And if you're wondering why you've not heard of him, it's because his career was cut short at the age of 27. He died of malaria, we think, uh, in Rome. And so a majority of his artwork is here in the Brancacci uh, and that other fresco called the Holy Trinity. But up on the entrance wall of the Brancacci Chapel, we have one of Masaccio's most celebrated paintings, which is his expulsion from Eden. All right. we're, we're in the early 1400s and most artists still struggling to make people look like people in their paintings and statues. Uh, and here instead with Masaccio, we've gone well beyond that. Uh, the idea that first of all, these figures walk with feet firmly planted on the ground, their bodies casting shadows. So these are not illusions. These are substantial forms that obstruct light. Look at the use of the chiaro scudo, the light shade contrast to articulate the musculature through the calves, the quads, the buttocks, and the rib cage of Adam, who should have his hands covering his genitalia, right? The first consequence of original sin was the consciousness of nudity, but instead he's so overcome with despair that he forgets to, and his hands instead cover his face. And you can see by the facial expression underneath it, that he is in an almost senseless uh, uh, feeling of mourning right now with his mouth pulled back and his eyes pulled forward as well. Not to mention Eve next to him, who stands in that Venus pudica, that modest Venus pose covering her nudity. But every time I look at this particular painting where her face essentially is just this mask of despair, where, where emotion has overridden reality, and I cannot help but think of Eve's face next to the face of the screen here by Edward Moon, uh, painted at the end of the 19th century. It is absurd that I can successfully connect an early 15th century painting with a late 19th century painting, but I just did, right? Or how about quiet despair? And that in the Pietà, of Michelangelo. In fact, of all Michelangelo's artwork, this has always been my favorite. And the reason is because it's so unusual. Most of Michelangelo's artwork is loud. In fact, one of the things I often do with my students is to encourage them to associate pieces of music that they are familiar with, with works of art that we're studying to help them understand the essence. And I've always maintained that when I look at Michelangelo's Pietà, what I hear is a solitary flute or clarinet or violin playing. It's a very silent type of despair that I think is best expressed by that left hand of Mary. You know, this gesture of inevitability. She knew this was gonna happen from the beginning and she accepts the fate uh, that she accepted 33 years before 
uh, when she took on the responsibility for being the mother of Jesus Christ. It's an incredibly powerful emotion that Michelangelo conveys in this representation in his Pietà. And of course, we have to put Caravaggio uh, into this list of artists who successfully uh, communicate despair in his deposition, uh, where we have this construct of figures, John here, whose finger's about to slip into the wounds of Christ, this older, very unflattering image of the Virgin Mary, the bowed head of Veronica with her veil, and of course, perhaps the most emotional of all of the New Testament figures, who is Mary Magdalene instead. Artists using gesticulation, using facial expressions to communicate what it is that makes the human species so unique, and that, of course, is emotion. Well, how about joy? And how is joy expressed by artists? And again, inevitably, to do this, we go back to the Scrovegni Chapel, to one of the most extraordinary paintings uh, in the history of art, and that is Giotto's meeting at the Golden Gate. All right, let me give you a little context here. Things started off badly with poor Joachim when he was kicked out of the temple, and then he went out in the wilderness, but he actually took matters in his own hands. He ended up offering his own sacrifice to God. That sacrifice was accepted. His wife, Anne, who was actually in Nazareth, received a message from an angel that she was expecting a child. Um, but in a world without cell phones, where we can't text each other, honey, come home, I'm pregnant, the storyline or the screenplay is she's in the city, he's in the country. They both just found out they're going to have a kid. So it's that cliche Hollywood scene where they start sprinting. Okay? They're sprinting, but we're going to do it in slow motion. You know, their hair blowing in the wind, the chariots of fire music playing in the back. And when they come together, of course, the most expected thing for them to do is to express their joy collectively by hugging and kissing. Right? Now, consider that we take this for granted, but Giotto's student, Tadeo Gaddi, was actually denied uh, permission to show St. Joachim and Anne kissing in a uh, painting, the same painting in Santa Croce, because it was thought to be inappropriate. And so the question is, how does Giotto get away with it? Uh, well, A, he's one of these guys who does it and then apologizes later if he broke the rule rather than asking permission. But two, the extraordinary thing about Giotto is that his stories are so human that we sort of forget that the protagonists are actually supposed to be divine. And more than just the hug and a kiss, look at the, the way he's constructed it so that their two bodies become a single volume. It's Joachim's right eye, her left eye, his nose, their mouth, his right arm, her left arm. And what is the meaning of procreation if not the fact that two people come together to form another? This is pretty profound stuff. And consider that this is the seminal image of a kiss in Western culture. Okay, so every famous iconic kiss scene, if you're thinking about Klimt, if you're thinking about Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall, if you're thinking about Leonardo DiCaprio and whoever, it all goes back to this kiss. This is the first one. And look at the surrounding. I mean, you get the sense of this were the movie. You know, look how bubbly these women are here, looking at the two of them, celebrating this sort of joyous moment. You can hear the happy music, you know, Bluebird coming down. There is joy in Mudville this day. But if then if I'm the movie director, what I do is a close-up on this figure in black and the music suddenly changes to dun, 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 right? Because this figure is a foreshadowing element, reminding us that as joyful as this story gets, and it will get absolutely ecstatic at certain points, ultimately it is a tragedy and will end with a man nailed to a tree as the expression goes, right? Or Giotto again, we're still in the Scrovegni Chapel, uh, and one of the comments that I find myself making more and more often is that the older I get, the more I appreciate Giotto, okay? Uh, because he's just, he's a, a commentator on life. He's a narrator of life and the human condition. So this is the birth of the Virgin Mary. That larvae, like looking object that you're looking at there, is actually postpartum uh, Mary. She was just born and wrapped in her swaddling clothes. And here's mama, right? Now, after hours of excruciating labor, all of that pain and suffering and fatigue wears away. And look at the eagerness with which she reaches out to grab her newborn daughter. And I've seen it twice. I'm a proud father of two children, and I've seen this happen both times, which is extraordinary. And so the question is, if that is the Virgin Mary up top, who or what is that? Well, that's the Virgin Mary as well. 
typical of Gothic art to repeat the same figures more than once. And the curious thing is that what's going on here is that the midwife is actually clearing out the nostrils of the Virgin Mary. So I mentioned a minute ago that Jalta was a master at making divine subject matter look uh, rather human. Uh, one would imagine that when the Virgin Mary was born, she actually flew out of St. Anne's womb, you know, with a cape and an invisible jet and what have you as well. Instead, Jalta depicts it as a very human birth instead. Okay, we now turn to the emotion of anticipation, right? Eagerness, awaiting something to happen. And many of you have already seen this sequence, also painted in the Scrovenia Chapel, and that is the story of the marriage of the Virgin Mary and how it took place. Okay? And again, I can't emphasize enough that we're talking about painting at the beginning of the 14th century, when, again, most artists are simply struggling to make things look realistic in the art. And instead, we have this master, Giotto, who recounts the story of how a suitable husband was found for the Virgin Mary. And the story goes that technically all of the young men in Nazareth who were interested in her hand in marriage were invited to present themselves at temple with a rod or a stick. Okay, these rods or sticks would be collected by the high priest, they would be blessed, and one of these sticks presumably would distinguish itself from the others, and the bearer of that rod or stick would win the hand of the Virgin Mary. Right? This is the story. And so Giotto begins his sequence of anticipation with this presentation of the rods. You see all these young men with full heads of brown hair showing up with their rods, although one of them, you notice, has that kind of George Clooney salt and pepper thing going here, and he has a halo on his head. This, of course, is Joseph, because according to the story, Joseph was considerably older than Mary and then the other men interested in Mary and was uncertain as to whether he should participate, even though he was very fond of the young maid. And so this is the presentation of the rod, and the next scene that Giotto paints is this one, and it is the watching of the rods. And it's such an extraordinary thing that in the early 14th century, a painter would dedicate an entire scene to nothing because nothing is happening in this painting. Everyone is eagerly awaiting something to happen up here in this pile of rods that have now been blessed. But in reality, it's not going to happen up there because the story goes that Joseph did not submit his rod. He remained at the back of the temple with his rod in hand when it miraculously burst forth into bloom. You see a lily popped out of the rod and a dove descended from the sky. And he was in fact the one chosen to uh, marry the Virgin Mary. All right. Now the idea again of dedicating an entire scene to nothing, simply to build up the anticipation or the suspense in this particular sequence. Okay? But as far as anticipation goes, I think that no work of art probably better communicates it than this one, okay? So we're all so mesmerized by the beauty and the monumentality of Michelangelo's David that we forget that Michelangelo has actually represented David in a very specific moment of the story, right? Now, question is, how do we know that this is David? Well, oh, two things. One, the thing that David is holding in his left hand, which is the sling, so eliminate that idea of the Bart Simpson slingshot that we're all used to, right? That Y-shaped piece of wood with the elastic. This is the pouch, right? Which is part of a long strap. The rock is inserted inside of this portion of it. Right? It goes all the way down his back. So that band that you see is the sling. And here is the stone. And when you whirl it around, you flick the wrist. The stone is in fact released. And so David is standing there with the sling in his left hand, the stone in his right hand, right? and there's the stone. You can't see it clearly, but that cupped hand suggests that that's what he's holding. And Michelangelo has actually depicted David in the very instance before his combat with Goliath. And what makes the sculpture so extraordinary is that we don't need to see Goliath because we see Goliath through David's eyes. And I imagine Michelangelo reading the screenplay of David and Goliath, right, which is in the first book of Samuel, where this young kid thinks he has it all under control. Because he's young, he, like most young people, thinks he is immortal. Two, David is faithful. 
and is firmly convinced that because he's defending Israel, that Yahweh is going to defend him, and three, that David is super confident with his weapon of choice, which is the slingshot, right? People forget about that little exchange that he has with King Saul, who had initially dismissed David. So you can't go out there and fight Goliath. David retorts by saying, when I protect my father's sheep, I protect them from lions and wolves. And so essentially he's insinuating how much more difficult can it be to kill a man than it is to kill a wolf or a lion. So don't you see the scene in the movie where David comes out Right? He's got it all under control, right? but then he suddenly realizes just how big Goliath actually is. Right? Look at that furrowed brow of David. Look at those Clint Eastwood in his prime eyes of David, those nostrils that are flexed. He's hyperventilating through his nose. His mouth is tense. His jaw is squared. His neck is tense. And that six-pack that you see on David is not just the result of the 0.2% body fat that this guy enjoys. This is an extended diaphragm. So I imagine Michelangelo poising David at the exact moment of the story where the neurons are zapping and he's starting to realize what it is that he's up against. And if I could turn the volume up on this statue, the two words coming out of David's mouth at this very moment are, oh bleep, when he realizes what he's up against, right? And so this notion of anticipation turning almost to fear. And so another gamut of the human condition and of our emotion. And let's look now at some representations of fear, uh, which very often actually appear in annunciations. Okay? So this annunciation by Simone Martini, which is in the Uffizi Gallery uh, in Florence, and is a prime example of a Gothic style painting with its elaborate frame and pointed arches, the background, the two-dimensional halos. But whether an Annunciation is Gothic like this one, or Renaissance, or Baroque, the composition of an Annunciation is usually the same, where you have the angel Gabriel to the left, right, the Virgin Mary to the right. Uh, the angel is usually shown as having just landed, which is why its wings are raised up and its robe fluttering off. As soon as it lands, it points up with its right hand to indicate that the big man sent it to deliver the message. Yeah. Olive branch in its left hand, olive branch crown on its head, indicating that the angel comes in peace. The lilies that are omnipresent in annunciations and symbolize Mary's physical purity. But my favorite part of this painting is the comic strip bubble motif. There are words in relief that appear on the surface of the painting and are legible. They read Ave, hail, the word that's missing but implied, Mary. Gratia plena, full of grace. Dominus tecum, the Lord is with you. So the first words of the prayer we call the Hail Mary are the words spoken by the angel to Mary. And I think you can tell by her body language that she is quite scared. Right now, let's put things in perspective. She's a 10 to 13 year old girl. She's not had a boyfriend yet at this point in her life. Uh, she just found out she's pregnant and she has to explain all of this to her Jewish parents, right? So I think she's taken it pretty well, all things considered. And I love the kind of thumbing her page motif here, right? And so I interpret this as meaning that as soon as the angel leaves, uh, Mary is gonna go right back to her reading and pretend like this never happened. It's a very teenage way to deal with the problem. If you simply ignore it, maybe it will simply go away on its own. As reluctant and as scared as Mary seems, she does agree, as we all know. And when she does, here comes the dove of the Holy Spirit with this cone of light coming from its beak, representing God's seed that then passes into her womb and causes conception to take place. So fear and overcoming fear at the same time. And in fact, fear in these annunciations. Uh, here is Botticelli's very beautiful annunciation also in the Uffizi. And Leonardo da Vinci's comment about this particular painting was that it looks as if the Virgin Mary would prefer to jump out the window rather than to become the mother of Jesus Christ because she's so melodramatic in her kind of Heisman Trophy position as one of my students described it here as she sees what appears to be a very aggressive, almost savage kind of angel here who has appeared in the window. So if Leonardo is essentially criticizing um, Botticelli for being melodramatic, 
in his representation of fear. How does he represent his enunciation? And the answer is right there. Okay, a 20 year old Leonardo da Vinci painting what is universally acclaimed as his masterpiece, his first professional work of art, marking the moment of transition from apprentice to master status. And look how much more calm his Virgin Mary is, right? I see a certain composure in her that reminds me of kind of Southern Belle composure. She's out here on a bright spring day, right? The Feast of the Annunciation is March 25th. The angel appears. She looks up from her reading. She does that kind of dainty thing with the left hand. You can almost hear the polite, ooh, you know, coming out of her mouth as she sees the angel. Calm and composed on the surface. But look at that right arm of Mary darting out and grabbing a pretty tall stack of scripture that she bends with her hands with force. So there is tension. There is fear in the Virgin. It's just expressed in a much more restrained way than we saw before. And you remember from last week, we saw a couple of very good examples of statues expressing this emotion of fear, the Apollo and Daphne. And there's that juxtaposition that I was talking about just a moment ago, where you have this effortless, emotionless face of Apollo juxtaposed against the sheer horror and fear of poor Daphne, who thinks she is in the clutches of her assailant here, right? Or of Pluto. And Persephone, same sort of thing. You don't really see any emotion or strain on the face of Pluto. It is all reserved instead for the face of Persephone here instead, right? And so the idea, again, of all the way from you know, Gothic to Baroque, we're seeing how different artists expressing the same emotion in their particular works of art, right? Um, how about horror? You know, this perhaps the most primal of all human emotions, right? This idea of just extreme fear, of extreme shock in someone. And again, we turn to Giotto. Um, one of the most, I guess, disturbing of medieval Christian images is the massacre of the innocents, right? This was the consequence um, of the three kings stopping off and asking King Herod for directions when looking for the newborn king. When Herod hears of this newborn king in his kingdom, he immediately says, I don't know where he is, but when you find out, please come back and tell me so that I too may go and pay homage. When in reality, Herod's intentions were to eliminate this newborn king for fear that he might have been a threat to his power. The three kings pay homage to Jesus, are then told in a dream to leave by an alternative route. Herod waits around for them to come back and he realizes that they are not he orders this blanket act of infanticide. All children under the age of two need to be killed in an attempt to eliminate this threat to his power. So here's Giotto's interpretation of the subject, which believe it or not, is rather restrained, right? You're not seeing any direct act of violence. There is a pretty disturbing image of these infant cadavers down below. Um, but for instance, this thuggish figure with the hood who's driving his sword through the child, you notice his or our view is obstructed by this guy in purple, so we don't actually see it, or this guy who's about to stab the child, but hasn't actually done it. And so the analogy I always use, remember the movie Silence of the Lambs, where you actually don't see any violence in the movie, but it's one of the most frightening movies uh, that I've ever seen. And it's kind of the same thing here. It's the suggestion of violence, uh, which is even more scary than the violence itself. Because what Giotto is actually emphasizing is the emotional response of horror. And there is no more horrific moment than a mother watching her child die. And look at the expressions on their faces. That, everyone, is horror. And, and, and expressed just so powerfully by Giotto with these expressions on their face. And as we get closer, uh, we actually start to see even more amazing details. And the fact that Giotto went to the trouble of modeling the plaster with his fingertips, shaping the plaster, into long tears running down the faces of these desperate mothers that you see. Here's an even closer view. The, the quality is not great, but you get my drift. I mean, this is really an artist just trying to get down into the trenches and understand what it is uh, to be horrified by something uh, as traumatic as losing your child. And if we were to go a different way with this notion of horror, then we can go, of course, with the great Caravaggio. 
Um, she just did not see this coming, right? And so, you know, it's not just Medusa's head, it's Medusa's head flash frozen at the instance that it was severed and separated from her body. Uh, and no one does it better than Caravaggio, who on his shield, this is actually also in the Uffizi uh, collection, it is a, a ceremonial shield. The surface is convex, which makes it even more effective uh, in driving that image uh, towards us. The face is Caravaggio's. We're, we're fairly certain that it is a self-portrait of the artist in the guise of Medusa with these snakes still writhing. Uh, and then the blood, of course, gushing from that truncated neck. And again, just frozen on her face, that moment of horror when she realizes that it's all over, right? Or how about surprise, right? So this notion of well, was not expecting that. And how was this um, kind of uh, expressed in, in various works of art? Uh, we turn to the early Renaissance. Uh, in fact, I'm in the middle, or I just started actually week one of an online course, Italian masterpieces. And day one was the story of the famous competition of 1401. Uh, between Lorenzo Ghiberti, who produced the panel on the left, and Filippo Brunelleschi, who produced the panel on the right. Uh, although Brunelleschi's panel did not win the competition, was the losing panel, he introduced a very innovative way to depict religious subjects, and that was with real physical strain. The subject is the sacrifice of Isaac, right? It's the rather gruesome Old Testament tale of Abraham uh, asked to prove his faith by sacrificing his only son. And the way that Brunelleschi sort of interprets the scene is that you can clearly see Brunelleschi, or um, Abraham is intent. And so poor Isaac on the sacrificial altar, struggling with every little bit of energy that he has. Abraham rather disturbingly pawing his son's head and with his thumb pushing up the neck to expose, uh, uh, pushing up the chin, excuse me, to expose the neck. And then that knife pressing down. So if this were a movie, you'd actually see blood already trickling down Isaac's chest, and then the angel, and this is Hollywood, right? This is, you can hear the dramatic music in the background. You hear the angel getting there just in the nick of time and performing some kind of jujitsu maneuver as he pulls up Abraham's wrist. And the expression on Abraham's face for me is price, priceless. This notion of surprise. You know, imagine having to work yourself up into this semi-catatonic state where you have to kill your own son to prove yourself to God, and there suddenly you're interrupted, right? Almost like a bucket of ice water being thrown at you, uh, and, and just that expression on his face, and so surprise. And, you know, Brunelleschi lost the competition, but at the same time revolutionized art, because if naturalism was the objective of these artists, like it or not, violence is part of nature. And it becomes now part of this cachet of the early Renaissance artists. They had never seen biblical figures of the caliber of a Abraham or of an Isaac or of an angel slugging it out this way. And so I always jokingly call Brunelleschi's interpretation of the subject the bar room brawl interpretation, right? Or how about perhaps the most celebrated image of surprise of the Renaissance in Leonardo's Last Supper? Right. Now, remember, what makes this so extraordinary, everyone, I mean, aside from the fact that it's just a gorgeous painting, is it looks less like Leonardo created the scene. Right? In other words, he thought about, well, how am I going to depict it? And it looks more like Leonardo was in the room with a camera. And like all great photographers, you know, his spider sense began tingling just before the climax of this evening, where Jesus and 12, soon to be 11 of his best friends, are celebrating their last meal, and Jesus Christ has just dropped the proverbial bomb on the apostles. And that bomb, of course, is that this night, one of you will betray me. And the surprise, I mean, it's like a, like a bomb blast, you know, just rippling through the entire group of people in an extraordinary way. Look at the reaction of the three here, where Bartholomew jumps up, Andrew pulls his hands here as well, uh, Peter, and the next group immediately leaning over. He knows John is real tight with Jesus. So he's like, ask him if it's going to be me. Ask him if it's going to be me. Judas kind of taken physically aback because he wasn't expecting Jesus to actually say this out loud. 
Here's James the Great leaning back, pushing the two other figures. Thomas saying, wait a second over here. What's going on? Uh, here, Matthew, Thaddeus, and Simon. You know, this idea of, of, of almost like a ripple effect, right? That surprise emanating from Jesus and then making its way all the way through all of those present at the celebration. All right. All right, so we've gone through a pretty broad array of different emotions, and I conclude with the half, perhaps the most powerful of all. At least Dante thought so, because he thought the greatest sinners were those who betrayed. And so the last emotion, you broke my heart, which is that feeling, in fact, when someone is betrayed. And no one in the entire history of art, in my opinion at least, betrayed that sentiment of having your heart broken better than did Giotto in his kiss of Judas, again, in the Scrovegni Chapel. My nickname for Giotto is the Alfred Hitchcock of the 14th century. Although, to be perfectly honest, I don't think even Hitch told the story as well as Giotto did. So imagine you're sitting in the movie theater right now, okay? So you're watching, you know, Mel Gibson's The Passion or whatever it is that you're watching. And it's the scene where Jesus and the apostles are in the Garden of Gethsemane. It's dead quiet, right? All you hear are crickets in the back. The narcoleptic apostles have fallen asleep. Jesus is praying. And suddenly that silence is violated by this horde that invades the scene, okay? So if you're in the movie theater, have you noticed that in the last few years, they turn the volume up so loud that it's uncomfortable? And inevitably, I always find myself looking up at the camera to see if they made a mistake. But that uncomfortable uh, audio it, it is meant to kind of make it a full sensory experience or what have you. So this is that part of the movie where it just gets so loud that you're almost uncomfortable with what's going on. The rattling sabers and torches, the trumpet that's being sounded, Peter lunging forth, cutting off the ear of the Roman soldier. And now if I'm the director, what I do is I zoom in on the two of them and I just drop the sound. This goes to total silence. And then all of a sudden, right, what you see is this incredibly profound moment of Judas wrapping Christ in this robe of yellow that he has, looking up into these immovable eyes. I mean, this is God. You're staring God in his eyes and Jesus looking down. I mean, this is inevitable. This was destined to happen, et cetera, et cetera. But you can't help but wonder what it feels like, at least on the part of Judas, to know what it is that you are doing, that for 30 pieces of silver, you have just betrayed all that is good and all that is extraordinary, okay? And in fact, I still remember seeing this painting for the first time um, back in 1993. I was a kid, I was an undergraduate at the time, and immediately it evoked one of the most iconic scenes in the history of film, which essentially captures that extreme emotion of betrayal and having one's heart broken. And that, of course, is this one, okay? Godfather II, uh, when Michael Corleone, of course, discovers that it was his brother who tried to have him killed. Now, me telling you that Francis Ford Coppola studied Giotto before he made The Godfather is probably hyperbole. Uh, but the fact that I could show the two of them side by side, that I could compare a 14th century painting to a 20th century movie is proof, of course, that the constant denominator in all of it, whether it's film or painting or sculpture or what have you, is, of course, the human condition and a human condition which is deeply entrenched uh, in an emotional state. Okay? With that, I will close off and I would be happy to answer any questions should you have. Okay, fantastic. Well, thank you so much. And I know we have a number of questions coming in, so just a reminder to go ahead and type those in the Q&A box. First question is um, about, the, uh, about the lives of the artists. So can you review for us just the title um, and the author so everybody can get their own copy of Vasari? Perfect. Everyone, just a word of warning, okay? And I think that, Katie, you probably will attest to this. We always make this sound much more entertaining than it actually is. 
<laughs> because as art historians, what we do is we go through and we pull out these great little anecdotes that Vasari writes or these little tidbits or what have you. So, and I've had this happen so many times. You all run out and buy Vasari's Lives of the Artist and think that you're going to be up all night reading it because it's a page turner when about 80% of it is rather tedious writing. Uh, my advice, buy it, okay. I don't make any commission on this, but my suggestion is to buy the Penguin Classics version because it comes in two volumes. So you get volume one first. If you like it, you can go back at volume two. Uh, and the other advice I give you about reading Vasari is when you get to those tedious, boring parts where you have no idea what he's talking about or what is going on, skip them, okay? And try to get to those parts where Vasari is actually telling some cute little anecdote or funny little story about different artists, right? But we do have a tendency to make Vasari sound a lot more entertaining than he actually is. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Um, what other um, either primary or secondary sources would you recommend for folks, whether, you know, beginners or more experienced lovers of art, especially for people who are, you know, big fans of the museums? <sighs> That's a tough question. I've, I've had actually this uh, posed to me now so many uh, different times over this past week, interestingly. Um, the one thing I can do, if you are on social media, um, every Thursday on all of our social media platforms, so Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and everything else, we do an on my bookshelf theme every Thursday. So, you know, and again, I got a backlog of these things. Now we've been doing it, I think for the last year or so. So you can see a whole series because it's hard to find that one book uh, that kind of defines it all. Uh, the other thing, in fact, if you write Katie or write me, uh, she can forward your email to me. I do have a sort of suggested readings list um, that I provide to people who um, A, either take my uh, educational programs in Italy or B, take my online courses. And I'd be happy to share that with any of you. So if you write me, I'll actually send you the list um, of books. And then from there, remember what you want to do is then look at the bibliography in those books and they will send you into different directions as well. Yep. Okay, big question about perspective. So, before Giotto, we see a lot of flat painting, right? Sort of Byzantine style, very flat, lack of perspective. Is that a stylistic choice or do they just not understand how to do perspective? Both. Um, the Greeks and Romans never achieve single point or linear perspective in their art, right? Um, they instead apply what we might call intuitive perspective, where they're just so good at reproducing what they see that there's a degree of, of, of three-dimensionality. So they never get there. But then again, there's a total breakdown of the values of Greco-Roman society because the Roman Empire comes to an end in the fifth century. So that, that kind of realistic style of art doesn't really make sense. And what replaces it is that very abstract style of art that comes from the East, right? Byzantine art, technically speaking, uh, where the subject matter is exclusively Christian. That's all they're doing. And so those gold backdrops suggesting otherworldly settings, you know, it's taking place in heaven, not here. And then the two dimensional to suggest otherworldly because we live in a three dimensional world. So it almost becomes a kind of escapist art where, oh, look, there things are different and there is beyond reality. It's almost transcendental uh, in its nature as well. So it was kind of a little bit of both, right? I mean, it was the sort of gradual breakdown of, of the, the values that produced art that was somewhat realistic. Uh, but then because the market doesn't demand it, um, they kind of forget how to do it, right? And the same thing goes for monumental, monumental architecture. The same goes for uh, naturalistic sculpture, that it's not until the Renaissance when the market begins to demand art that looks realistic, that is three-dimensional, that does uh, uh, incorporate classical architectural language that we go back to the way they did it before the Byzantine uh, period. Yeah. So the most popular question that we've gotten several iterations of is, I think, your titular question. So what do you think uh -huh. Mona Lisa's emotional <laughs> state is? What is she, what's, what's her feeling? You know, it, it really is a, to me personally, I would almost accept Vazar's explanation of it. Um, you know, this is a big issue that I know most people never think about. But if you did, there is, there's a real importance to it. And that's, you almost never see teeth 
in medieval and Renaissance art. Okay. Um, and the reason you never see teeth is because you don't want to see their teeth. Uh, the Romans, the ancient Romans had a pretty good grasp of what we call oral hygiene. Uh, they would use urine, for instance, to brush their teeth. The ammonia uh, would, of course, kill the bacteria. And they had a pretty good uh, uh, oral condition. Uh, in the Renaissance, you know, they didn't bother at all. They put it this way. If you suffer from bad breath, you chew on a piece of raw garlic to give you an extent of what we're talking about. And so when people smiled, you know, had this tendency to kind of cover their mouths with their hands and very rare to see teeth in art for that particular reason. So smiles, if you think about it as well, you don't normally see smiles. In fact, that full range uh, of joy, you notice the one that I was kind of shortlisting was uh, joy. I had two, right? I had that moment where uh, Joe Kim and Anne were kissing. And then I had the expression on uh, St. Anne's face. I don't know of that many more representations of these joyous moments or what have you. Because I think artists might have almost unconsciously, you know, diverted away from those moments because smiles are just not part of the repertoire because teeth are not part of the repertoire as well. So why is she doing it? I don't know. I, I do see this almost, you know, reaction to maybe, you know, Leonardo was just a funny guy. What if he was just telling joke after joke and, you know, he, because you can't remember, she's sitting there, he's painting her, but she can't maintain that smile for the entirety of the time. Um, so Leonardo would have taken, you know, probably physical notes like Caravaggio used to do, where he would take his pen and sort of make incision marks onto the surface of the canvas to sort of indicate. And perhaps it was this particular moment that Leonardo decided to capture that best kind of represented who uh, Lisa Gerardini actually was, right? And it happened yeah. to be this, maybe she was mischievous, maybe she was funny, maybe she liked a good joke. Um, I don't know, but what I do know is that this painting is so buried in sensationalism that I think it will be virtually impossible to ever extricate what the meaning of that smile is, which is why I'm so hesitant to answer the question because I don't want to feed the beast of you know the Mona Lisa. Uh, which <laughs> doesn't need any fee, any more feeding, let's put it that way. Right, right. Um, a question about um, the Last Supper that we looked at a little bit earlier. So it looks in the, you know, images we saw today in very bad condition. Um, so what is, what is the sort of state of preservation now? What's, what's being done to keep it from falling um, apart further? They limit the amount of people. Um, any of you who've been to see Leonardo's Last Suburb may remember that it's a pretty daunting experience to get in, um, where they put you into a series of hermetically sealed rooms so that you, know, you go into the first one, the door shut, then another set open. Then you move into the next chamber, door shut, another open. And then once they've cleared out the actual refectory, which is where the painting is located, uh, that's when you're allowed in. That's good because it keeps the temperature pretty constant. It keeps the humidity, humidity pretty constant as well. But what it's not doing is uh, filtering the gunk, to use a technical term, Katie, that we're taking. <laughs> you know, with all that stuff that's floating around out here, everyone, we have that on us. Um, so you know, when 33,000 people walk into the Vatican museums, they're bringing all that pollution with them and that pollution then starts floating around and it settles on the artwork that's there. Um, the system at the Scrovegni behind me is pretty much the most avant-garde system in the world. Uh, and to be honest, I, I've been kind of throwing this out there that, you know, they may want to consider doing something like this for the Sistine Chapel, where you, you, you have to pre-book your visit to the Scrovegni Chapel. You have to show up uh, half an hour in advance, get your tickets. And then you think you're going into the chapel, but in reality, your reservation time, <coughs> excuse me, is to step into this glass box outside the chapel where you're made to watch a movie for 15 minutes. And while you're watching the movie, there's a deionizer that's running, pulling the gunk off of us. They have this special carpet that cleans all the stuff off your feet. And then you go through this series of hermetically sealed doors. So not only is the temperature and the humidity kept constant, but technically we've all been purged of any kind of pollutants that we have on you. Problem with that is that of course, it severely limits the amount of people who can do it at one time which for the mm -hmm. Scrivania is not a big deal because it's not the most popular um, structure, but for the Sistine Chapel, I think would just drive people mad uh, if you can only let in 100 or 200 people uh, at a time. But that's the direction in which we're going, by the way, uh, right. for a lot of this stuff. Right, and I know it's a, a major concern at the Vatican Museums as well, to how to keep you know HVAC systems and 
all the sort of environmental controls upgraded to handle oh, the huge number of visitors who come through and the, you're exactly right, all the stuff that sort of floats in with them. Well, I think that's about all the time we have for today. So Rocky, thank you so much for oh, another fantastic welcome. lecture. And next week we have our good friend Caravaggio. Oh, it's next week. Car in fact, I was about to ask you. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, I couldn't exactly. remember what we had on the bill. Next week is Caravaggio. Yeah, next oh, week's fantastic. Caravaggio. Fantastic. fantastic. Yeah, so we'll, we'll do a deep dive into Caravaggio um, and some of his just absolutely remarkable work and his equally remarkable life. So once again, thank you so much to our sponsors uh, from the California and Northwest chapters. Thank you to all of our patrons and guests who were with us today. We hope that you all are well and in good health and that your families are well. Thank you so much for being with us. We hope you'll consider joining us as a patron um, and we'll see you next time. Ciao everyone, see you next week.